This is the Resilient Performance Podcast. Welcome to Keep It Real, episode number 16. Uh, we got a text message recently from a, a coach friend of ours um, asking about a client who he works with who wanted some programming that had some extensive orthopedic issues, um, is in the Marines, and he was just kind of asking questions generally about what someone like that, you know, with, with the specifics of his case and, and orthopedic issues, what are some things that they should avoid or, or, or do? Um, and then generally speaking, you know, with our experience, what are some things that someone in that career field should be doing? So that just kind of brought up the, the topic uh, generally about what people sort of imagine they need to be able to do. Um, you know, if say a patient comes in and they're an athlete or they just want to have general fitness, their sort of perception of what they need might not actually match what we think or, or you know, or what they what they actually need to continue to move forward and progress and feel good and move well and be able to train and perform for the you know for the long haul. So that was just sort of the topic to go with. Um, so one of you guys want to take it first and run with it? Yeah, I mean, I think if we're talking about like the military to begin with, a lot of times the people's initial exposure to physical training is in a selection course where. The goal is actually not to get them fit and prepare them for, prepare them for their job. It's to, it's to select them and to weed out people that they don't think have the physical, psychological fortitude to proceed with the remainder of the training. So in a lot of ways, their initial exposure to physical, I don't even want to call it physical training, but to just like structured physical activity is basically punishment where the idea is to get people to try to quit. And so a lot of times they take that mindset with them once they do qualify and get to their units they think they have to train and go for broke every time they they go to the gym so that's that's kind of number one so selection is not training um and you know physical physical training can be a good proxy for some of the other characteristics that you really want to select for because you can't take an untrained person and have them do missions in afghanistan or syria or, or somewhere like that you want to see that they can handle discomfort work well as a team, think their way through problems and being sleep deprived and physically and psychologically stressed is a proxy for some of the things that you really care about that you can't do in training initially because of the time, financial and logistical constraints. But then once people get to a unit, even if it's like a special operations unit, there's often this perception that like, well, you have to be ready for anything. Therefore, like your, your training has to reflect that. But you know, it's the old axiom, like if you train for everything, you train for nothing. So I think that like with any other sport, you have to do a needs analysis and figure out like, what are, what are the real priorities from a physical standpoint? I think for, for the military, it's you wanna have relative strength, you wanna have really good you know, like aerobic ability, and you also wanna have the ability to maybe do things in short bursts. If you have to like sprint to get behind cover or like pick somebody up, you know, drag a, a litter, that kind of thing. Um, what you tend to not need is the stuff in the middle. And that, that's, that's the case in a lot of team sports too. But ironically enough, a lot of the training that, that people in the military gravitate towards is the middle stuff. A lot of like really like glycolytic work, um, you know, where it's, they don't do a lot of work at low intensity in a more like aerobic type zone, which, is, which tends to be the kind of stuff they do the most of. They don't do a lot of like real, relative strength work. Um, they do a lot of like training to failure and kind of like a like a, a bodybuilding or like a higher rep range. And they're doing a lot of just like I said, more glycolytic type things, metcons. And they also do a lot of things. And Trevor can maybe speak more about this because he brought it up before our call. Things that have a really high learning curve and technical component. So like, I don't want to have the whole like, should athletes or military people do like Olympic lifts as an example debate right now, because that could be its own conversation. But like if someone's never Olympic lifted and they're in the military, I don't, I personally don't think that learning how to Olympic lift is worth the investment in time. When like in a special operations unit, they have to be good at, at shooting, at parachuting, at diving, at communications, at medicine, at land navigation, all these different things. And they don't even have enough time to do their, their tactical and technical disciplines enough. So to like take something that, that requires, you know, even more than like two minutes to do well, in the gym just to me is not worth it to achieve the kind of, the kind of outputs they need. So that's kind of maybe a, an overview of what I think 
that population needs. But like you said, Greg, a lot of times their perception of what they need doesn't match the reality of like, they, they don't have to be, you know, Olympic decathletes and CrossFit Games champions and, you know, Ironman triathletes. They need to be like physically prepared enough to do their job and then have a little bit of a buffer. And so they need to be fit and certainly way more fit than like the average person. They need to be physical generalists, but they don't need to be great at any one thing. They don't need to train like powerlifters. I mean, I've seen some units where they'll bring out like, you know, a really high level powerlifting coach to teach the squat, de deadlift and bench. And then they'll have like a, a champion kettlebell lifter teach kettlebell lifts. And it's like very like, like specialized and piecemeal, but there's no one to kind of like put things together. And so these, a lot of these people don't know, like how, do, how does all this stuff fit into a unified training program? And I think that simplicity for this population and even in sports is reign supreme because the, the, the complexity should be in like the, the actual job preparation, not in, not in the ancillary or the su supportive training. I think your your point, Doug, about like the being generalist is super important. And I, when we like when we were working with the, the you know the, the people that we worked with in the past, it's like if it, it, it is spending so much time trying to learn like the technical side of of fitness, meaning like the different you know Olympic lifts because those are very technical major or whatever it is. If they're something with a really high skill component in the weight room, it does take away from like their cognitive real estate to be able to focus on the technical and tactical parts of the job which is a million times more important than learning how to like appropriately do a kettlebell snatch or or, or an olympic lift or something of that nature um and i think you know if you are spending so much time trying to learn the, the technical component of things in the gym it's going to be like it's a it's going to take a long time so then b you probably won't either you're going to not be strong enough you're not going to get enough fitness adaptation from it in a population that gen like genuinely needs to be fit to be able to do their job well, or you're going to try to get a fitness component when you don't have the skill component of it. And then you're going to have a higher risk of injury. So I think, you know, that's why like when we were programming for, for that po population, we tried to do things with like as little learning curve as possible that really worked on like those output based qualities more than worked on, um, more than worked on like the actual skill component of things. So like, like the strength work was a lot of like, you know, search or squats or something really simple for a lower body strength that you can just pick up a weight and kind of move. And there's our, the risk reward. There's not a huge risk with it. And we would do a lot of things like sled pushes and sled drags and, and those kind of things that keep their joints in pretty good positions. And again, have such a low learning curve, but you can still really good, get a good fitness adaptation to it. And then I would add with what you're talking about with like the low intensity aerobic work, I think for most people, especially in that population, because of the selection stuff that is so much on your feet running all the time, we didn't really program a lot of running for that population. It was a lot more like the things that, that Doug crushes still like, you know, HICT type stuff, whether you're walking on a, on an incline treadmill with, with a weight vest or whether you're doing uh, HICT step ups with a weight vest for 20, 30 minutes out of clip, just doing something like that, where there's really, you know, low impact on the joints. It is a more of a, a longer duration thing where the velocity of the movement is really, really low. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, so going back to with your experience and like with the general, you know, everybody in the military is doing different jobs, of course, physically, but if you had to put like numbers on it, what's the, this is the age old question. Like what is strong enough? Like what is enough endurance? Like, could you put some sort of metric to it for people who are listening? Yeah, I guess I would like to see, I think most people in that population should probably be able to trap bar deadlift, double their, their body weight, which like, that's not crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's not two and a half. It's not three times. Like, so if you're, you know, like 180 pounds, 200 pounds, that puts you in like the 400 pound range. And that, that might even be more than you need. But I think if you can do that, like you don't need to get stronger. Right. Um, aerobically, it's, it's a little more challenging because a lot of the benchmarks that people typically use for that population are running based. Like, I don't know if you can say if you can run, I'm, I'm sure like if you did enough nor normative data, you could, you could find that like, if you can run a mile in a certain amount of time that like you have the aerobic fitness, but like I, what I would want to do if in my perfect world is I want to get people to do some kind of like an incline treadmill test with a standardized weight. So, you know, depending on probably somewhere between like 60 and 80 pounds, which is probably the, at the higher end of what people should be carrying on a mission. I know they carry more sometimes, but you're almost like combat ineffective if you're carrying more than that. Um, and then get normative data on like, all right, like what, what's a reasonable distance to cover like in 
in an hour, you know, on like, let's say a 25% grade with 60, 80 pounds, I wouldn't go more than an hour just because like that now your, your testing is taking up, you know, it's detracting from your training time. But a lot of times like with, you know, people want to find shortcuts, especially with, with aerobic work and you just can't do a bunch of Metcons and glycolytic work and then expect that it's going to prepare you for, you know, like a 10 hour overland movement. Like you might be able to get away with it, but it's an accident. You're not really prepared for it. Um, so there, there are unique adaptations you get from doing things over an hour. And I think that like, even though time is a big constraint in this population, they need to spend one or two days a week approaching continuous activity for an hour to get those adaptations. Um, and that, that's why we like the HICT stuff because, because the intensity might be a little bit higher with an HICT variation than what they might use on the job. You're getting the aerobic adaptation, but you're also, because the intensity is higher, the duration's a little bit lower and it's more realistic for people who have competing demands. I, I actually want to do a podcast with the guys who wrote the, uh, the Uphill Athlete book and I reached out to one of them and haven't heard back yet. So if anybody has a connection with the Uphill Athlete guys, maybe try to facilitate that because you know, they talk about how like they work with even some climbers and alpine athletes who like one of the, I listened to their podcast and one of the athletes they work with is a PA and he's on his feet, surgical PA is on his feet like 12 hours a day. So he really can't do like three hour workouts when he gets home. So they tried to find ways to actually prepare him for ultra marathons using kind of like a lower volume approach. And if you're going to do lower volume, you've got to raise the intensity, but you don't want the intensity to be so high that you can't accumulate enough volume. So it's always that, that sweet spot, but I would say double body weight, trap bar deadlift, um, and then possibly even into like some kind of a carry, like, so maybe even like a trap bar deadlift for a couple of reps, not a one RM, maybe even something like, let's say 350 for three to five reps, pick it up and be able to walk a certain distance with it. I think if you can do that, now you've got lower body strength covered. You've got grip strength covered. You've got the specificity of like carrying a litter and that kind of thing. I'd want to have some kind of like an aerobic type event, like the weighted, um, incline treadmill walk for about 45 minutes to an hour and try to just like pass fail. Can you do this distance? Some kind of like a pull-up test, maybe strict pull-ups with like 25 pounds to simulate body armor. Um, I, I would want to see people do maybe like in the eight to 10 range of strict pull-ups with that 25 pounds. And then possibly even some kind of like a this is where I, I want to have some kind of like a sprint thing, but I wouldn't want guys running like forties, you know, and because that's higher risk. I don't know if I'd want guys even doing like a hundred cut, you know, so maybe that's where I might, even though it's a test go kind of more in the glycolytic range, like, like a 300 or something mm -hmm. with no kit, because you have to be fast to run a good 300 and you have to have a little bit of kind of, you know, that's going to be a different reflection of their aerobic fitness as well. So for a test, I might like something like that and want to see guys, you know, again, this is just a pass fail, right. probably be able to break, break like 55 seconds, something like that, which again, is not terribly fast, but like, I, I want, I want the kind, I want it to be the kind of thing where if you can pass the test, we know you're kind of mission ready. And so if a guy can trap our deadlift, double body weight, walk around with it, do eight to 10 pull-ups and kit, um, you know, some kind of like an incline treadmill thing with weight, and then run a 300 and let's say like, you know, some oh. low fifties. Yeah. I think now you've got someone that, that really covers the broad spectrum of physical abilities that you need to do that kind of mission. Very cool. And then um, Trevor, you kind of cut out on us for a second there. Yes, I did. <laughs> and then just generally speaking, I'm wondering, you know, have you guys had any other cases, non-military related people come in where you know, the, the expectations didn't meet reality on, on what they should or shouldn't be doing. And I'm just trying to think of examples. From I, this. I have that a lot. I, I would say with some of the people who their, their number one form of exercise is, 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 you know, running, whether it's, you know, they do, whether they do do marathons or half, mile, or half marathons or whatever, but they're coming to us again, they typically come to us in PT because they have some sort of ache or pain or symptom um, where they kind of, they need to be doing some strength work. But in their head, when when because they've had other people, whether it's friends or family or coaches that they've had in the past, to tell them that they need to be doing strength work. In their head, they think that you know the 
they they're currently running five days a week for 60 to 90 minutes they think in their head that they need to be strength training for five days a week for 60 to 90 minutes when they currently do none so for those people i always have the conversation that's like i need you to do you know 20 minutes of a couple of really simple exercises like a sled push or a kettlebell deadlift or whatever it is you know for for probably a total of 15 to 20 minutes two to three times a week and that's probably enough enough of a strength component for you to be able to get the adaptation that we need because you're currently doing nothing. So I think there is that almost like an all or, all or nothing mindset for a lot of people in terms of what they should or should not be doing. It's like just adding in something new, you don't need a, a ton of it because you do none of it. So we add in a teeny, teeny bit, we're gonna have probably enough volume and enough intensity that we're gonna get the adaptation that we need for you to be able to do the other things that you actually need to be able to do. Yeah, one example I'm thinking of um, also is like people will come in or because I'm working with a lot of like col college age or high school age kids where they've trained for a few years now and they might imagine that they need to be doing what they've been doing for the past few years for like forever. So I'm just thinking off the top of my head with like a trap bar deadlift, for example, I had a conversation with a college kid about like sort of what you were just saying before, Doug, is like how much is enough? And once you reach enough, then just keep it and don't continue to push past there. And then you can shift your focus to more of like, all right, I'm strong enough. So now let's get more powerful. Let's get faster. Let's be more elastic. Let's get really, really good with change of direction, um, short ground contact time type of stuff um, and sort of shift your focus to that while then like just kind of touching your maximal strength stuff less frequently. So you're gonna feel even better um, and then you know, so your, your training should change as you get better. And that was sort of the expectation is like, well, I've done, you know, some, some hard effort, max effort type strength work, sort of like every off season or like year round for years. And I need to keep doing that and keep pushing the envelope. So that was one example I thought of. And the, yeah, I think the reality is like people should be training this stuff all the time anyway. So even and this is like almost a, a periodization talk, but people talk about how like you have to have like a strength base to do power work, let's say. And like that may or may not be true, but I don't think for like if you're a speed based athlete, there should ever be a time during the year where you don't do any speed work and all you do is lift. Yeah. So you might prioritize strength a little bit, but I mean, like, are there any good sprinters who are like, you know what, like I'm going to devote more attention to lifting than I am to, to sprinting? Like, I don't think that actually exists. So once you get to the point where you're strong enough, like you're going to keep strength training and maybe even the same, you know, number of days a week, but you're just not going to like try to go for maxes and like, you're not, it, there's no benefit to trying to like to PR in the gym. So like, if you can, if you can get to that double body weight trap bar deadlift, like you can keep trying to progress the weights, but you should never feel like in training that you're going to like miss a lift or have to go to failure because now, now there's like, you know, more of a chance for them to go wrong. So you can keep trying to improve in all these things, but I don't think there should be the urgency, even at any point in your training where doing a supportive thing like lifting, you should feel like you have to set like a PR. Like as long as the weights are, are going up, then you know you're getting stronger. So there's no reason to me to like have to test it. And you know, any experienced lifter, even people who focus solely on strength will tell you that when you've been lifting for a long time, like the weights don't just go up. So you might, even if you're trying to get stronger and prioritizing it, the weights, Aren't, are, are going to go up when they feel like going up. You're not necessarily going to have control over how much additional weight you can do. So once you have enough training experience and training age, things kind of plateau anyway. It's more about just being consistent, not necessarily trying to, you know, to, to push the weights heavier. Anything else on this topic, guys? Or anything else you want to talk about? It doesn't have to be related to it, really. I think it's... The last thing is just the whole like risk reward thing. I mean, regardless of the sport or occupation, um, you, there's going to be enough orthopedic stress in all these these sports and in these occupations that the goal of strength training is to just try to increase that you know that physiological potential that that bank account so to speak. And if you can do that without having to withdraw as much in the process, that's that's the goal. So. Um, like using the military people as an example, like some of them, if they're in like a unit where they do a lot of shooting, they might be in body armor every single day for hours at a time. 
So like for that population, like maybe doing like really heavy single leg work, it, it seems to make more sense to do that than to do like a lot of back squatting and conventional deadlifting and even trap bar deadlifting. I wouldn't trap bar deadlift that population more than once a week. And if I did, I would make sure that it wasn't when they had a lot of like lumbar fatigue from wearing body armor all day. So I'd want to make sure it was done at the, the right time of the week. Um, because none, like no one cares. These guys aren't making their money because of how much they deadlift or squat or bench in any sport, unless it's powerlifting. So, you know, we, we can talk about trying to get specific with it, but all these people are kind of the same. They're human beings first. Like how do we prioritize their health and longevity and their performance while also developing strength, speed, power, conditioning, um, and the, the health and longevity piece, I think should be like the priority because if you're not available for your job, it doesn't matter how, how fit you are and availability is the best, best ability in sports. Yeah. I, I really like your point there, Doug, about it's like pretty much everybody needs to be a generalist unless you are one of the, you know, like a, a track and field athlete where you're super specific in terms of you just have to have be really elite at this one output or if you're a power lifter in that regards, like most team sport athletes and kind of the military population as well. It's like, they have to be able to kind of do everything in different amounts, which is why their training should, like you said, take into consideration the most important thing that will keep them, that'll either keep their job, which is the technical tactical component. So understanding like the practice schedule and how intense their practices are and what they're doing outside of their time with, with us, whether we're PTs or strength coaches really should we, we need to have that information because it is going to impact like our, our day-to-day -day selection and exercise selection and programming and progression and periodization and all that stuff. So I think that's just a, a great point of like, we always have to look at kind of the totality of what the person is dealing with on, on, in their life and in their sport or in their, in, in, in their job with regards to the kind of military population, like we've been talking about today, to be able to give them what they need at that time while keeping them healthy enough that they can go and do their job as effectively as they can. Awesome. Well, that's all. Let's we can wrap this one up. Nice, quick, straight to the point type of episode. I like it. You guys have anything else? That's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Resilient Performance Podcast. As a thank you for listening, we'd like to offer a 10% discount on our online products, which you can find at resilientperformance.com. We'd like you to use the promo code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, to get the 10% off. Right now we have the Resilient Movement Foundations course uh, online format for you to purchase there. And we hope to grow that soon before the end of the year and have some other offerings. We hope you enjoy. Again, that's promo code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, for 10% off. Thanks.